So, Peter, your investing philosophy is often summed up as buy what you know. And there's some truth to that, and it's also often way oversimplified. Sure. Can you explain what you did mean by that and, sure, and what you sure. didn't mean? Well, I, it bothers me that people are, are very dangerous when they invest. This word, play the market, that's a dangerous term. But if you do some work, do some research, know what you own, look at the, research, look at the balance sheet, you, if you could add 8 and 8, get fairly close to 16, you can find out this company has lots of debt, no cash, they're in trouble, you shouldn't own it. So a little bit of research. People are careful when they buy a refrigerator, careful when they take a vacation. And they, they'll put five, ten thousand $10,000 some stock to hear on the bus or to party. That's dangerous. So when you say buy what you know, you also thought that the regular investor might be able to get an, an inside right. advantage right. Right. by sticking to an industry right. he's familiar right. with or seeing something right. that she realizes right. is a great right. product. I'm imagine if you were in a mall the last 50 years. You would have seen Gap when it was hot, you would have seen Limited when it was hot, you would have seen when it was not hot. You would have seen when they were starting, people weren't excited about Gap anymore. Or, or, then you do some research and say, well, gee, there's a lot of limited stores, but we're only at 20. You know, they can go to 400. So you, you, you see a company, I did really well with Dunkin' Donuts, a local company. I did well with Stop and Shop. But people could see that this is really some people showing up, or I guess the Sunglass Hut, no one's there anymore. So I mean, that's research. That's fundamentals. So in but you don't leave the mall, though, and buy that day. You, you have to do some more work. <laughs> That's the important point. Yeah. So today, uh, there's so much information everywhere, information overload. Does that make it harder for active investors? The indexers say everyone's got access to the same information at the same time. You can't beat the market. Well, the way you beat the index is you, you avoid the stocks to go down. You avoid the steel companies and the oil companies and Sears and Penny and where the companies are deteriorating. I mean, companies are dynamic. The, the, behind every stock, there's a company. These are not lottery tickets. So we, you're trying to find the companies within the S&P 500 that are doing better. They're going from crappy to semi-crappy to good. That might take a couple of years. Or they're going to grow for a long time. And you're trying to avoid the companies that are going south. That's how you beat them. Or you find some companies outside the S&P 500 that are, that are Great companies, CarMax was not in the S&P 500, they went up 200-fold. So a lot of companies that enter, and a lot of their great performances before they go in. Now, a lot of people, when they're lucky enough or smart enough to get a company that's going up, they then they take their profits. Right. And, and you made the case in a book that you should actually hang in there with the really great stocks, and you even got a call from Warren Buffett as a result. In 1989, I'm at home, and the phone rings, and I thought it was one of my friends, but one of my daughters, I think it was six-year-old, Annie picked up and said, Chief, guess there's a Mr. Buffett online? I said, this got to be a joke. So I pick it up and this, this Warren Buffett, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. You know, I read your book, my airport's doing two weeks, can I use the line? He said that all in about seven seconds. <laughs> and I said, that's great, I'd love to do it. What, you know, what's the line? He said, I love this, it's been waiting to do this. When you sell your great companies and add to the losers, it's like water in the weeds and cutting the flowers. And he said, I want to put it in. He said, if you ever come to Nebraska, you don't call me, your name will be mud all over Nebraska. So did he call him? Oh yeah, I've several times we play bridge together. We've had several meetings, great guy. Another point you've made, and this is I think particularly relevant 10 years into a bull market, is that I think you said more money has been lost anticipating a downturn than actually in the downturn. Can you explain? Well, obviously the market's, market's gone up tenfold since I stopped running Magellan. So you make more money on the upside. The market's going to be a lot higher in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. Trying to predict the market is really a waste. I don't know what it's going to do. It can go down. When I ran Magellan, 13 years, it declined 10% or more, nine times the market. Wow. I had a perfect record. I went down more than 10% every time. Whatever the market went down, I went down more. But over the long term, the upside is more than the downside. So you've got to say to yourself, do I need the money in the next month? Do I need the money in the next year? Do I have kids going to college? Do I have a wedding coming up? Then you're a bad investor. If you, if you, if you can keep putting money in, you have 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 year, you should do well.